Without a shadow of a doubt, it's the crunkest show in social media history. I want to welcome you to the war zone. I got my fabulous co-host Donovan Sadiq, the Nubian queen Demetra K, and tonight, my old schoolers that's down with it, man, we might go to the cafe tonight, man. <laughs> I got R&B blues sensation. Chick Rogers in the building. Oh. Hey man, we gonna get messed up tonight, man. Y'all better get a seatbelt because it's gonna be on. Say I wanna take the time out to say welcome you to the war zone and another fabulous day. I hope you guys are sidetracking that corona as best you can. I hope you sidetracking that corona as best you can. But it's always good to see my co-host in the building. And tonight, we got a bona fide legend in the building, man. You, you, you can act like you don't know who it is. But I seen the comments when I put a picture up. When I put the flower, you got some real fans all around the country that's waiting right. on you to come in. How you doing, Miss Chick Rogers? I'm doing well. Thank you. How you all doing? We blessed. We blessed. Uh, good. Uh, right now, you, 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 what city are you located in? So we want to shout out to that city while you're in there. I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, baby. She in Memphis, Tennessee, y'all. So let, let's scream at the homies up in, I got some homies up in Memphis, Tennessee, man. They ain't the type that go to the, the suit and tie functions, but they still my homies in Memphis, Tennessee. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this interview over to my good friend, Demetra K. So um, welcome, Miss Rogers. We are so excited to have you here. So um, I only know about uh, blues, if you will, uh, via my mom and my grandma. And I know, you know a couple of artists and stuff. So I had to do my research on you. And I was uh -huh. listening to this song called Messed Up. Uh -huh. like, you know what? I think a lot of women can relate to that. <laughs> I know, I know. Basically, were you talking about, you know, how a man, you know, I'm just paraphrasing, he's done you wrong. I mean, in the song, he's even brought a baby home. I was like, ooh. Uh, <laughs> so um, can you tell us about that song? Is it, I, I hate to, I think it's a personal experience, but um, what made you uh, write and sing that song? Okay, first, I didn't write it. It was written by Omar Cunningham. And we had never met before. Of course, I'd have done, have uh, had those experience, not the baby part. So I, at the point, at the time he called me about the song, I was in the separation with my husband. So it, it has something to do with the, the husband, but personally, he didn't write it for me. I mean, he wrote it for me, but we didn't know each other. Yeah, like I said, when I listen to it, a lot of women um, could relate to that. I mean, I talk about it all the time. I've been cheated on by almost everybody I've been oh, yeah. But never had nobody bring a baby home because um, if I did, I'd be in the penitentiary conducting this interview right now. <laughs> well, I me, mean, I understand. <laughs> so um, it looks like you originated, uh, originally started singing in the church. And then- uh, if I'm wrong, uh, please correct me. So I originally started singing in the church with your father, and then you um, joined a group called Clockwork. Is that correct? Clockwise. Clockwise. I'm sorry, Clockwise. Um, so can you tell us about your experience um, with Clockwise and then your experience singing in the church, and what made you transition from the church okay. to, I guess, what they call secular music? Okay. Singing in church was like, that's where I started. And circular music, I kind of sneaked and did it mm -hmm. uh, when my parents didn't know. But how I got with Clockwise, I, after I finished high school, of course, my mom wanted me to be a nurse like her. So I went to school for nursing. And December of 1979, I had a patient to call me the N-word. So I immediately got mad, of course, and I was ready to quit the job. So my supervisor said, don't quit. But Clockwise called me the same evening after I got out of work and said they need a female to audition for a USO tour in Germany. So I told him, yeah, I'll audition. So when I auditioned, 
uh, because they didn't have a female and it had to be a female in the group. We won. And that's where it started. And so how long did you sing with Clockwise? We traveled for about, we were together about three or four years because Clockwise was the band I brought to Houston. We came to a club called Club Delisa. Uh, the manager name was uh, Big K, they called him. And the club was on Martin Luther King Boulevard. We came and I opened up for Shirley Brown. And he enjoyed me so much. He moved me and the band to Houston for a six month contract to work at his club. All right. So now uh, talk about your time in Chicago, where mm -hmm. I guess it's another home of the blues. Uh, it looks like you went there in what, 1989 it was, I believe I read. That's correct. I moved there October 89. Um, and I went and I went and did an open mic at the Cotton Club on Michigan Avenue. And this guy, I never forget him. I'm trying to think of his name. He played, oh, it's on tip of my tongue. He played on Car Wash, Jimmy Spinks. Jimmy Spinks. He told me, he said, girl, you sang the blues. This cause this, you know, Cotton Club was a jazz club. So he took me to the club called Kingston Mine. And when I auditioned, you know, of course it was a blue club, but I auditioned with uh, neither one of us. And the club owner said, uh, you need a job? And I told him, yeah. So I worked that blues club for over 10, about, about four blues clubs in Chicago until up to 99 when I got married. Well, let me let me ask you something, Ms. Rogers. I know okay. we, we we lost a great one, you know, um, over the weekend. We lost a, a great one, Betty Wright. Betty Wright. Yes, how right. how influential was Betty Wright to your career? I love me some Betty Wright. And if by you being DJs, I would need help with this. Betty Wright had a song that was uh, raggate like feel, and I used to sing it, but I can't remember the name of it, and I don't remember what. Uh, album that was on, but I love me some better, right? Uh, she was very, I, but my idols were Rita Franklin, Pat LaBelle, and Shirley Caesar. You know, uh, um, speaking of that, you just mentioned uh, Patty LaBelle. Uh, you shared the stage with Patty LaBelle. How does it feel to like actually be and meet somebody that influenced you? I mean, what was that feeling like? I was so nervous, I wanted to throw up, but I did. She, I mean, you didn't try to outshine her, did you? Um, I wasn't trying, but I think I did. Cause uh, I had a big article about me on in the newspaper the next morning, and they said that I did. So I guess I did. <laughs> is 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 Patty the diva off stage like she is on stage? Well, I didn't get a chance to meet off. Stage. But she, after she, I was, I was trying to hand her back the microphone, and she was like, "Uh, uh, uh you gonna finish this song?" So that kind of made me, cause she asked Memphis, "Who is this?" Cause I had too much voice, I guess, to be so little. She asked him, "Who is this lady?" And everybody said, "Chick Rogers." She said, "Oh, y'all, so she, y'all know her, huh?" And she promised me that she was gonna help me, but okay, I've heard that thousand times, and uh, here I am. I never heard from Patty again. So, I mean, you, you've worked with a lot of people. Tell us, tell the audience some of the people that you've had the, 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 the opportunity to work with over the years. Ooh, my favorite was Bernie Mac. Uh, I've also worked, uh, Coco Taylor promoted a CD on me. And in the midst of promoting it and everything, that's when she passed. I also did her wedding and I also worked in her blues club. She was like a godmother to me. Um, um, oh, so many. Ooh. Um, man, uh, I, I, I've been on stage with uh, Bobby Womack. I opened up for Bobby Womack, Millie Jackson, um, BB King, uh, oh, Alba King. Oh, uh, that's just a few that I could think of. You know, I, 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 I've been dealing with rap music for 30 years and and you know, a lot of people say, well, man, you didn't get rich. I say, but dude, 
to share the stage with some of the people that I've shared the stage with, I say, man, that that that's payment enough, man. Something because you yeah, you got a plethora of experience when yeah. you're watching how they 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 do what they do. You know, I've, right. I've had the opportunity to just sit and watch Bobby Womack warm up. Oh, and I'm okay. like, hey, man. yes, yeah, because I mean it's serious, man. And and some of them are so serious, and when you get to talk to them, some of them they just regular folk. Yes, they are. They just regular folk. Right. So what you got? What you got coming up in in in, in this new year, Miss Chick? Even though we're in the middle of a uh, a pandemic, being an artist never stops for us. So what what you working on right now? Well, I'm working in a couple of songs. We I got a couple of writers working with me on some songs, but uh, I want to go to work, and get on the stage. But and I think right uh, before the pandemic happened, you were scheduled to be at the Arena Theater in Houston. Am I correct? That's correct. I was in Chicago. We had it was the weekend of March 13th. We had Chicago, well, Indiana that Friday and Detroit that Saturday. And I was in Chicago when they canceled the whole tour. Wow. Yeah. Dimitri. So um, obviously you've toured all over the world. Um, looks like uh, Europe and Japan, but it seems yeah. like um, Japan or the Japanese, they like really love you. Cause when I was looking on YouTube, I see, I saw a lot of uh, Japanese channels um, basically um, had a channel dedicated to you. And so how mm -hmm. are, it, from what I saw, <laughs> so how are the fans different um, in Japan than they are out here? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. They are great. They receive you very well. They are more receptive than, you know, and they are, they just love you to death. They, they love you to death. They really show their love. They, you know, they give little gifts and they always come with flowers. So I love Japan. Um, Japan was the best overseas tour I did. Cause I went there about four times. Italy was okay. Italy was good, but I love Japan more. I've been to Italy, Texas. I ain't never been to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's the thing I love about music. If you if you get off into this music game, it can take you places that you you never could imagine. Mm -hmm. You never could imagine. Donovan, go ahead. Uh, Miss Rogers, with the, yeah. the state of music nowadays, and R and B is is struggling to stay alive. As an as a, somebody who's been in the game for a very long time, what is your take on these younger singers? Some of them that are in R. I'm not talking about the rappers. Talk about the R and B singers. Um, what's your take on you know the the industry with these younger singers? And some of the stuff that you had to go through because you know you, back in the day we had the Chitlin Circuit, we had our little thing that we did. Yeah. Now you've got these these younger girls coming in or younger singers coming in and, you know, the industry's changed as the way they market themselves. But you know, just what's your feeling about how the industry is now versus, you know, some people I think it was somebody said, like, putting in work, Dionne Warwick. It was Dionne Warwick. She said, like, Beyonce, how is she an icon when she hasn't put in the work yet? Amen. Mm. Uh not much of me, uh, messages to me what they sing and I don't understand what they're talking about and they don't put on no clothes so I don't care m much about the R&B today because the R&B today it really don't have a message you know what I'm saying it's, there's no message in the music there, it's just a lot of uh, take off your clothes or I'm going to tear up your car and, eh, that's not music that's not music I'm going I'm to say this, what you saying that, the one thing I can always say in the blues arena, no matter who did it, male, female, they were always dressed impeccably well. Always. Always. I mean, always. I looked at some of the old YouTube videos. Yeah. Tyrone Davis wanted to clean the cash he ran across, man. You see what I'm saying? B.B. King stay suited up. Oh, you know, the, the females, I mean, it, it Millie Jackson and, and all these folks, you know, they, they, they carried themselves Amen. In, 
a different on a different level. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, you yes, know, sir. I, I want you know if you could speak to the younger audience, whether it's R and B, blues, or whatever, especially the females, because I have a problem with that right now. I don't think you have to exploit yourself. That's right. To be an artist. That's what right. would you tell the younger female artists right now, as far as just being a lady in the industry? Uh, just because you have a nice body or a man said that you're cute and you, you know, you got all this doesn't mean that you have to, uh, show it, give them something to think about or to, uh, uh, imagine, you know, don't, don't, don't let everybody know what you, you know, what's on your mind. And, uh, if you're going to sing, sing. For, with a message to get out to people to help somebody that's going through something or help somebody that need to know that they can be loved and no matter who they are and what circumstance they're in. All I say is just sing and keep your clothes off. Demetri? So keeping along um, those same line of, um, I guess, questioning, how do you think um, the music industry got to where it is now, um, away from um, artists who had class and dressed with class? How and why, in your opinion, do you think it's moved to where it is now where, I mean, I I can't think of a time in modern day history where I haven't seen many female artists on stage with just a leotard on. I'm like, well, what happened to the pants? That's I mean, right, right, right. What's going on with that? Is the promoters? Is the the, the the promoters that promoting that type of music because they're exploiting women now? That's all it's about. Sex is selling, not music. Sex. So that's what it's the promoters, cause and the writers that's writing that kind of music. That's why I can't get no hit, cause they they playing that kind of music. I can get a hit. I might take that back. It's just, it's, just, it's just it's it's bad because people like me with the voice, with a good voice and a message to get out there, that's not what the you know young people don't want to hear because and they're the one that's buying the music. You know, you don't buy records no more, you just download. So it's 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 the industry, the promoting. That's what so I I'm, think. I'm gonna go to the to the business side, Miss Chick. All right. Payola. Back in the day, we know it was what it was. Does it still exist? Special and if y'all don't know what payola means, that means paying these radio stations to play your records. We know back in the days, if you if you watch Cadillac Records, you know the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you saw Chess had to pay to get mm -hmm. money. You know, is it still going on? Or you know, how was it trying to be an artist back during the payola era, which was very very prominent? Well, if if I'm paying a DJ to play my music, I don't know nothing about it. My manager doing that, but I, <laughs> yeah, I know what's going on in the back of the day, but I ain't paid no DJ. I think they just love my song. That's what I'm hoping, because if that's the case, then I won't be played for a while. But I got to read their poems. I ain't got no money. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this question, because it happened okay. to tons of artists. Uh huh. Has anybody, you know, especially in the in the olden days, I mean, even now, has anybody ever stolen your material and used it and blew up on it? No. No. Hmm. I think that go back to the rappers. They the one doing samples and taking folks made, but I. That that no 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 one has done that to me to answer your question. Donovan, um, yeah, um, is, is there anybody in the industry because you, you're talking about like uh, songs that you want to you know sing you know and and you're a a singer you're a singer is that is that what they say, Demetri? You're a singer. Okay. And there's a lot of uh, decent producers out there and uh, and you know in the early days when you did it you know some of them are uh, you know like they're getting older they're not in the industry like they used to but if you had to work with a producer today or somebody that you would really want to work with, uh, could you just name us 
maybe somebody you would like to work with? Let me see. Producers. Well, the ones I would like to work with dead. Um I'm sorry to say that, but you know, <laughs> now it's Maybe like Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, or a baby face. Baby face, a... baby face, baby face, baby face, baby face. Okay. Or oh, anybody okay. that's promoting or producing Tony Braxton. I love me some Tony Braxton. That's my would, girl. Would, would you say Tony Braxton is kind of taking the mantle of our R&B a little bit and kind of holding it up as best she can yes, in regards I think to music? So. I, yes, yes, I do. I do. Well, what about that's a little sister? The R&B, only R&B singer that I think that's, that's keeping it up. Demetra? I'm sorry, somebody was trying to call me. So did you get a chance to watch um, Erica Badu and Jill Scott over the weekend? Uh, you know, um, Instagram is having this thing called Versus. I guess it's a page called Versus where they uh, put um, artists against each other. Well, not against each other, but I guess they play their hits to see who had the, 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 the best music. The most votes or something? Yeah. Did you get a chance to watch it? No, I did not. I didn't okay. know what was happening. I'm kind of yeah. not hearing you all good now because when this person called me. I can't hardly hear you. How about now? Very little, but I can still hear you. Can you hear oh, me? I, we hear you. Yes, we can hear okay, you. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. And so, well, um, if you ever get a chance to watch it, it's on YouTube. It's Jill Scott uh, versus um, Erica Badu. And okay. of course, everybody, I think, is familiar with their music. But, right. you know, I think most people went to watch it because they thought they were going to kind of be, you know, duking it out and, Maybe a little bit on the mean spirited side, but it turns out everything was the opposite. They were so loving and, you know, just a complimentary of each other. Um, would you say that it was like that with you um, when you were working um, with a lot of um, other artists? Like you said, you worked with uh, Pat LaBelle and um, different people like that. Would you say uh, you guys had a lot of camaraderie or was there ever any maybe drama? Involved? Well, um, working with Millie Jane, you know, you're going to get some drama. Uh, she was nice, though. You know, no no drama between me and her. It's just she just she's being her. Um, now, a lot of artists here in Memphis that I work with, they're, I mean, they, we, they're good. Uh, speak of, like, Queen Anne Hines, uh, used to be with Jay Blackfoot. Uh, my best friend uh and you know like most singers you know you you're gonna have some that like you and you're gonna have some that don't and you know some support some won't but you know i get along with most everybody because i try to be the type of friendly person to you know give love but if they don't want it i take it back and then also uh, um a little record just passed we all um, yes, heard about that um, and I don't think a lot of people um, really understood. Well, I think our, we, we understood, but a lot of people really didn't understand and know about the contributions he actually made to um, rock and roll. And, you yeah. know, he talked about all the people he influenced, like um, Jimi Hendrix played for him and the Rolling right. Stones and all those people. Um, why is it that you think? A lot of people didn't know about uh, the actual contributions he made. Do you think it was purposely hidden? Because we know a lot of times uh, back in those days, the white artists got all mm -hmm. you know, the accolades and the attention. Mm -hmm. um, really, they were just kind of leeching, not kind of, but they were um, leeching off of black artists. And earlier before we came on, Donovan was talking about Elvis. And I kind of saw a look on your face like, eh. You know, because when people hear about Memphis, they think, you know, automatically think of Elvis. But we know Elvis, you know, stole all that from the black heart. Yes, he did. I so truly believe that. Um, I think Elvis and all those, the Beach Boys, all of them stole music from the Chuck Berry. Uh, uh, even some of the dance Jackie Wilson did. They Somebody stole some of that. I, I, I mean, yeah, because... You know, I was born in 58, and I saw a lot of racism. And I tell you, when they said that Elvis Presley was the uh, rock and roll, I'm like, hell, he wasn't even 
thought about Chuck, what about Chuck Berry and like you said, uh, Little Richard? But they will play music and don't even put out a picture on the albums. You know what I'm saying? They put a white person picture on it, but they use our voices. So, yeah. mm -mm. sorry, I, I didn't like that at all. Memphis is quote unquote the home of the blues. The home of the blues. Let these folks know some of the artists that then came out of Memphis, Tennessee. Jay Blackfoot, uh, Aretha Franklin, uh, hmm. Shirley Brown was from St. Louis, but she, she, you could say she come out of there. Uh, I just got to stop. It's, I just can't think of everybody, but you know, those name a few. Chick Rogers. Um, exactly. B.B. King. Yeah. Al Green. Al Green. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Stack yeah. Records. Yeah, Stack Records. And... Stack Records, yeah. yeah. Man, I'm going to tell you, and, and a lot Rock of people don't know that, that, that Memphis was actually the birthplace of rock and roll, too. It's okay. the home of the blues, and they consider it the birthplace of rock and roll, too. And we can't forget 3-6 Mafia, Raul Hernandez, oh, one of your God. fans, said. So... They, they out of Memphis, too. Oh, okay. No, I tell you what. what? Final what? question, Miss Miss Dimitri. Um, I don't really have a question. I just, you know, have a compliment. I love learning about new artists, and I'm going to add you to my playlist. Because, I really, I, you know, I like all genres of music, but, you know, blues, um, really just reminds me of my late grandmother and my late mom. Yes. Really, you know, Bobby Womack, Bobby Blue Bland, all those people. Yes. I'm gonna add you to my playlist. God, thank you. And thank you for coming. All right, thanks for having me, Donovan. Yeah, I just, you know, again, thank you for coming on the show, Mrs. Rogers. And I, I just want to tell the the watchers and the listeners. Before the show started, me and Mrs. Rogers were talking about where we're from and stuff like that. And you got some diva artists out there. You know, there, there are some people you just you just can't do them. But uh, Miss Rogers, just very approachable, sweet lady, just you know, straightforward. She tells it the way she uh, sees it. And I mean, you know, I, I knew you know who she was, but I'm just talking to her like she's a a regular person off the street, you know. So right. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna go check out that song that Dimitri was talking about, and uh, listen to your music and share it. But I did see a lot of your uh, videos and your concerts in on okay. YouTube, and I'm gonna ask my mama, who who's into the blues, you know, has you know, has she uh, have any of your uh, music or heard of you uh, performing and stuff? I'm very sure she had. My mom is really big into the okay. the blues stuff. Denise Lasalle, the old. South oh, yeah, Denise. Yeah. Well, I want I want to thank you for your contribution to music. I, I love music. I love all forms of music. And uh I, I I think that the youngsters need to really gain a measure of respect yeah. for 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 the for the guys that have been in music. And I don't like calling them old artists. I I don't do that. For for the, the ladies and the guys that kind of paved the way for them, I don't That's think right. that they respect you guys enough. They they definitely don't go through half the stuff y'all done been through. What you say to, to 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 get to the point where they are today. So I, I appreciate your contribution to music, and you always are welcome back to the war zone whenever you get ready. Whenever you crank up the next tour, whenever you do a a, a new single, okay. let us know. We want to embrace you and show you some love. I appreciate that so much. Thank you, Miss Chick. We we, we got Thank love you. for you. We're gonna keep it messed up all night long, y'all. All right. And then y'all give a big round of applause for Miss Chick Rogers. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Bye. Man, hey, that's a, one, yeah, man. That's a real one right there. Like I said, she's just so down, you know, homed and you know, and just and and very humble. You know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of stars untouchable you know don't talk to me talk to my uh pr person kind of like demetra that down there exactly <laughs> exactly all right so we'll go to the second half of the show i'm gonna put a question up for y'all and let's see if we can get it answered so i put the question up it's gonna pop up you know we got the slight delay but y'all can see it 
Now, what I really meant to type is tell us why black people don't like the Republican Party. That That's a monster question right there. That is a monster question. Because I was having a conversation with someone earlier. And, and if y'all get the time, Elvante had a guy on his show named Charleston. And he's a he, he's a former gang member that got his life in order. Ended up with oh uh, man, I'm thinking like a 12 year sentence for murder at 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 14 years old, and got out of jail, reformed himself, but then he switched to the Republican side. Switched to the Republican side, and basically his ideologies kind of lined up with mine. That you know everything that he's able to get done for his foundation or his organization. It seemed like the help was only coming from white Republicans, but then we're trained to hate them. So my question would be, and 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 hopefully we get a lot of interaction from the audience, is why? Tell me why black people don't like the Republican Party. You want me to go first? You can go first. Um, well, I think we should be honest and just lay it all out on the table, tell the full story. Um, the Republican Party has done a lot of things to make black people not like them. I think we should be honest about that. Um, but I think it's mostly because of black people have been taught that the Democrats are your friends. The Democrats are the party of the people, right? They, they give you stuff, and, you know, the same old thing. So I, I think it's just been we've been conditioned to think that Republicans are all bad and that Democrats are all good. Well, we know neither one of those things is true. And as my friend James says, we shouldn't like either of them because neither party has done anything, you know, for us to even be talking about. You know, what am I saying? Like, have they um, given us reparations? No, both sides of the, um, the aisle have both said, I don't think black people should get reparations for a whole host of reasons. Um, have they, um, even without reparations, have they either party improved the conditions of black people and as a whole? I'm not talking about individually, I'm talking about as a whole. How mm -hmm. about our education in the black community? Has that been improved? What about politics? Has that been improved? Businesses. So none of those things have been improved for black people under any party, but specifically, we've been taught that the Republicans, you know, um, are the party of the KKK, which in fact it's not true. Um, it's actually the Democrats are the original party of the KKK. We call them what Dixiecrats back in the day, where they were big time segregationists and they didn't want anything to do with black people. Y'all stay over here. We'll stay over there. They were the party. Um, if I'm not mistaken, wanted to succeed um, from the rest of the country, you know, for a whole host of reasons, racism, pretty much. And so we've just been taught, you know, the Democrats are your friends. But in essence, ask yourself, a friend is actually going to help you, right? A friend is actually going to do things for you that you can say, well, you're my friend. And has the Democrats done anything that you can really call them your friend? I get I get confused by it because, I mean, you know, we, we're supposed to hate the Republican Party. But Donovan, isn't that where we came from? Exactly, exactly. Everybody keeps forgetting that it was the Republican Party that uh, you know, ratified the uh, 14th Amendment and all that other stuff. They, they did reconstruction. I mean, they tried to do certain things until they got tired of it. But what it is is people keep forgetting the Democratic Party is known as the left. The Republican Party is known as the right. You have a right arm and you have a left arm. You have one body. They both, <laughs> they both are just two arms of white supremacy, the body. So it, it, it the, the premise is white supremacy no matter what party it is, okay? After a while, the Republicans said, we don't wanna deal with you. Now the Democrats are dealing with you. The Democrats are fighting harder not to give us reparations than the Republicans are. But and, and that's something that 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 I saw you type in and explain to them exactly what you mean by that. OK, well. Well, what I mean is, uh, like in my comment, I said both parties are two arms of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. 
Like right now, you, you have Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats controlling the House. What was the first thing that Nancy Pelosi did as all you people are out of work, you know, the country's going to hell in a handbasket, she's giving money to major corporations. None of this stuff can be done without the cooperation of the party. So trillions of dollars have gone to the corporation. Now she gives you a $1,200 check. And then when you go to the Democrats and say, well, what about re reparations? What do they say? We're going to study it. Let, let, let's talk about it. But they're, they're coming up with trillions of dollars out of the woodwork. So, so basically what I'm saying is it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or a Democrat. There, there's one thing that these groups agree on. Keeping black people at the bottom so that the system can uh, uh, survive and thrive. They both agree on that. And that's what we got to understand. I'm not telling you to be a Republican. I'm not telling you to be a Democrat. I always tell people, vote your interests. But in my opinion, you need to be an, uh, an independent. That way, I, there's some things about the Republicans I like. There's some things about the uh, Democrats I like. But at the end of the day, they should be giving me a transaction for my vote, you know, for, you know, for my influence. If they don't have it and you don't have a black agenda, you ain't got, you're not getting Donovan's vote. Um. I'm looking at a comment from James Schneider. GOP call you a nigger. The Dems apologize, but treat you like one. Now I'm gonna go inside of that comment. Why you can't, when you do subsidized housing, why can't it be something of decent quality? Why is it that we can't fix the roads in the rough neighborhoods. You know, that, that's, that the roads that are messed up in certain communities. Why is it that we can't address the violence? It's sort of like they need these ghettos to survive so that they can realistically push their agendas. You know, and maybe I'm saying this wrong. Maybe I'm totally wrong. But I know in my heart, and I know that for a fact that they create programs, the Democrats, to keep you dependent on the government. They create programs that are designed to keep you poor. But then you get mad at the other side because they say do for yourself. We don't want to do for you. Do for yourself. So I'm trying to see it's the lesser of two evils. And this political season is a very, very hot one. And a lot of people are looking at us three. They watch this show for insight. And I would tell somebody this here. You know, white supremacy, all that, everything everybody say. I get it. So I'm gonna let y'all be the be the y'all gonna be the interviewer and I'm gonna answer the question. Ask me who I would vote for for president right now. If I had to vote for president right now, the Donald probably would get my vote. Now, Joe, I want you to remind yourself of something. Show me what you did for me to make me switch it. Oh, I didn't piss black America off. You might be mad. But it's a lot of people in America that's thinking the same thing. Because the empty promises are not working anymore. They're not working anymore. We don't see anything. And then when people say, hold your vote, you want to get mad at us. So what should we do? Let, let's put that out there on the floor for these people here. Let's put that out on the floor. What should we do? Continue voting for a party that gives us nothing? Or should we go over here and vote for this party who you say is downright racist, but we racist on our side too? So who should we vote for? I'm going to leave that there because I'm, I'm, I'm hurt some people's feelings. Demetri, you want to take that? Um, yeah, sure, I'll take it. I'm not voting for either one of them because as Malcolm X said, choosing uh, voting for the lesser of two evils is still choosing evil. Neither one of those parties, the Republicans or the Democrats, have the uh, best interest of black people at hand, period. 
the minute one of them start talking about reparations and helping to make that's not, not making completely but helping to make things better for black people then i will entertain voting for them but i'm like let the people who are going to actually benefit from those parties vote for them because after a while black people we're going to be um, obsolete we're going to be obsolete why do you think they're catering to the hispanics so hard because they know that they are taking over the country in population uh -huh. so they have them hooked on phonics like we are hooked on phonics but after a while they're not even going to talk to us because they're not going to need us period mm -hmm. and so i'm not going to get involved in the political process as far as the federal election is concerned but the local election yeah sure but you know as far as you know the president let the people who are going to directly benefit from it um um let them vote for it right and in regarding you know the democrats Malcolm X said, and this is why I hate, because like Malcolm X's birthday is coming up soon. Ain't gonna have all these fake ass people, which I might even not even be on Facebook that day. Yes, she is. Off. All these fake ass people are gonna be on there throwing up all these quotes from Malcolm X and Malcolm X this, but those people are gonna take themselves into the booth and vote for somebody who has not their interest at heart. And he said in regards to the lying liberals, that's what he called them back then. He said, any black person that votes for the lying liberals, you are um, you are a disgrace to your race. You are no good for your race because you know what the Democrats do. They continuously lie to us and they have been since we started voting for them. But yet you continue to go in there and vote knowing you're gonna come out and get nothing. You had actually said you're a traitor to your race. That's what you are. You are a traitor to your race. You know what's crazy? We've been voting predominantly Democrat for 60 years. Now, when we first started voting for him, we had something. We are less than 12 years from zero and nobody seems shocked. Now, recently, a young black man was gunned down. And I think there's been two or three now that have been gunned down in the last couple of weeks. The Congressional Black Caucus, I was shocked when they put out a statement because that's all I've ever seen them do in my you know, lifetime, basically. But we still vote for these people who don't have our interests you know, at stake. But I, I just wanted the listeners to think about that. For 60 years, when we had stuff, we started voting Democrat, we had property, we had businesses, we had all this stuff. Now here it is. 2020, our wealth is less than $14,000 a year. And, and I think they, they pumped the numbers on that too. They already taken our houses. They're coming for the other houses now. We are less than 12 years from a slave and nobody seems concerned. This man got shot down. These young black men are getting shot down in the street. You don't see not one local official in any of the major cities and states saying a word. Why won't these people do anything for us? We don't make them. We okay, so here's the biggest question because you know somebody out there is going to ask that. How do you make them? Well, first you can withhold your money. Money talks. You, There is no power with no money. And as we always say, black people in America, we make $1.3 trillion a year and we trick off 97% of that, only keeping 3%. Now, what I mean by trick off, I probably should find another word, but not. No, that's the right one. <laughs> we give it to everybody else. White people, Asians, Hispanics, Indians, Arabs. They all get all of our money. They don't give any of it back. And so... They know as they, we're, and I hate to say this, but we are dead. We are the walking dead. If we were with, to, like, let's take Kaepernick, for example. When Kaepernick was going through everything he was going through, if every black person in America boycotted for a week, the NFL would have said, what do you Negroes want? Name I don't even think it took every American. If just the black know, players in the NFL wouldn't have took the field. Even if the NFL, even if the players took the field, fine. I get it. But if black people would have said, we're going to sit out this week, 
We're not going to watch. We're not going to go. We're not going to buy anything regarding the NFL. And we're going to make that clear. I guarantee the NFL would have said, what do you guys want? So the point that I'm making is if we just get on the same page even for a week and say, maybe we're going to stay home or we're not spending no money. I guarantee you people will start to come around and say, okay, because as Donovan said, everybody eats off of black people. Everybody, you name it, they eat off of black people. But we're too comfortable in receiving things and, you know, and being gratified, you know, symbolism. But if we were to hold our pocketbooks, then we would see change. That's my opinion. So basically... Montgomery bus boycotts is the blueprint because they bankrupt the Montgomery bus. I mean, the, the transportation system in Montgomery, Alabama. See, you got to have discipline to do that. But I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you guys. And it's something I feel. We're never going to come together. We're never going to figure it out. So if we never come together and we never figure it out, the Monroes, the Donovans, and the Demetrius, what the hell can we do besides beat our head against the wall? Well, we're actually preparing to leave the Africa. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, listen, the sad, okay, it was the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's birthday. Monday, I think it was, Monday. And as I put up his picture and, you know, said happy birthday, I got a little bit sad because, you know, he's 87 years old. And I said, you know what? He's dedicated most of his life to trying to wake black people up. I'm talking about most of his life. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's sad me to think that he'll probably leave here not seeing us as a whole. I'm not talking about the NOI because they're doing their thing. But leave here and, and not see black people as a whole. Just, just do some of the stuff that even the people before him was calling for us to do. And I fear that in our lifetime, we're not that old, but in our lifetime, I don't know. I just, I just like, I don't think we as black people as a whole, I don't think we care enough. I think, as I said, we are that, uh, that frog in the boiling water. We're just comfortable. No matter how hot the water gets, we just adjust to all the things that happened to us. And so um, I try not to be depressed, but it is very depressing once you really think about it. Well, I mean, depressing? it's like we just beating our head against a wall, man. I mean, I wake up every day wanting to, to better black America. And then when I get out there, I'm not fighting against the white people 98% of the time. I'm fighting against the black people. And these, mm -hmm. these, these black elected officials have conditioned some of y'all to fight against me when you know all I want is you to have decent housing. Why would you fight against me? Why would you fight against me if I just want to make the neighborhood safe? Why would you fight against me if I want to put a grocery store in the neighborhood? If I want better schools for our kids? And you people, you fight against us physically. You fight against us mentally. You fight against us with your votes. Because you're going to put the same person in office that did this to our neighborhoods. But then when it gets too bad and it starts affecting you, let me call Gary Monroe. Don't call my goddamn phone. I got other things to do, like feed my face. Well, you know, uh, one thing um, you, you got to ask yourself. When Trump was talking about Elijah Cummings district and, you know, R.I.P. Elijah uh, Cummings and stuff like that, that guy uh, won office in 1993. The funny thing was I was in Baltimore this time last year going to my son's graduation in Virginia. I had to I, I rented a Dodge Charger going through Baltimore. I had to put the pedal to the metal to get up out of there. I mean, he wasn't lying. How, how can you justify being a representative for over 25 years and your neighborhood was worse than when you took it over? But one thing we got to remember right now that this pandemic has done, and I, I'm going to show you what lack of wealth as a people has done. When you don't have, when you have lack of wealth as a people, 
you guys are the ones that have to put your life at risk to go work for somebody. Right now, some of y'all are like, oh my God, I got to go back. I have to go back to work. Why do you have to go back to work? You want to know why? Lack of wealth. And when, when we say lack of wealth, Demetri and I talk about it all the time. Uh, Gary talks about it all the time. We're out here buying bullshit when we should be uh, uh, collectively spending our money with each other and doing all this. This pandemic has exposed the fact that Black people are at the bottom of the system and we have no wealth. Because Demetri will tell you, I don't need to go to work. I don't have to go to no, nobody's job because I made the right decision. And I'm not saying I'm better than anybody else, but that's what I'm saying. Collectively, we give all our money away. We, we give all our money away. But I'm not worried about going to work. I got neighbors. I oh, mean, I got to go to work. For what? You're going to put your life on, on the line for a piece of paper? Really? So if you, no, nobody wants to hear the truth, that's the truth. If you are right now forced to say, well, I got to go and go out here. Good luck. Now, I'm going to put up a, a comment from Al Jackson. And Al said, and, and Demetra started smiling. And why are black people so scared to be in the hood? I'm going to flip that for you, Al. What's wrong with being in the hood? Why y'all so scared to get out the hood mentality? I'm in the hood. I live in the trenches. Me too. You see my mentality? Just because you live in South Central Los Angeles don't mean you have to have a ghetto mentality. A ghetto mentality is like going to a restaurant. That's acquired taste. You're choosing to be that. I have a millionaire mindset. And it don't matter if I'm living out there with the white folk or I'm in the bottom of the trenches with the dope fiends. I'm scratching at a million every day I wake up. But see, in order to get to the million, and this is our biggest problem, Donovan, we, we got to find the root cause to us not buying into doing what we should do, what Demetra tell us every night that we should do. We don't want to be responsible. See. You tell me you in the military. The lower the pay grade, the more work you did. As you moved up, you had more responsibility and less work. See, you don't want to be wealthy because being wealthy requires you to be responsible. Being rich requires you to be responsible. You had a multi-millionaire on here Monday night speaking and some of y'all were speaking irresponsibly while he was talking so you don't know how to be responsible so if you're going to be wealthy and wealthy is when your money is generational when you can leave this money for your kids and your grandkids if you can't do that and not through the form of an insurance policy then you don't want to be responsible the only way we can pull ourselves out of this hole, we have to take responsibility for the shit that we did to put us in this hole. Um, I want to say, I want to address um, Al's question. So I get why he's asking that question because a lot of times you hear people say, "Oh, I don't want to live in the hood. Oh, I can't wait to leave the hood. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Ooh, I don't want to live around all those people. This, that, and the other." But I always say, well, if we leave the leave in the hood, who's going to stay to fix it? And he's right. There's a lot of black. There's a lot of us who are scared to, to even go through the hood. You know, it was it was good for us until we got, uh, you know, two nickels to rub together. And after we got those two nickels then we want to move, you often hear people say, oh, I'm going to send my children to a better school. What you're really saying is you're going to send your child to a white school. You know, uh, they'll be ridiculed for being black. Well, they'll learn no knowledge of self instead of staying in the black neighborhood and fixing it. And I get it because we just lost Nipsey a, a little over a year ago because he was trying to help the hood. You know, and a lot of people say, oh, he should have left. You know, but he was trying to do exactly what I'm saying people should do. So I so I think that's a valid question, question why people are scared. And to your other point, 
about uh, Tony Busby. That's why I stopped asking him about the pro you know, politics and all that. I wanted to know his three keys to success. Forget all that. Tell us how you got to the money. So somebody who was listening could also do the same things. And I agree with him. Black people, we are so comfortable. We watch the most TV, we consume the most nonsense. And to his point, he said, I mean, him of all people, he said, I don't have to work. He worked nine hours that day and he's got money coming out of everywhere. But he's doing the work. And like you said, Gary, we don't want to be responsible. We want the shit to just fall out the sky. You know, oh, we want a job or a good opportunity to knock on the door. You know, as my dad say, you know, many people say, if you don't work, you don't eat. You know, and, and, and that's what is going on with us as black people. Overall, not all of us, we don't want to work. And I'm not saying like these little McDonald's, y'all don't talk about put the work in and build our businesses and improve our schools and that kind of stuff. We don't want to put in that work and that's why we don't eat. And so I agree with you. While Tony was on, people were asking stupid stuff. Are you a Trump supporter? Are you a Trump supporter? But like you said, you broke. It's probably as always the brokest people asking the low hanging fruit questions. So what? You should be asking him, how did you get to the money? Because I want to get to the money. Let me say this here. When you say low hanging fruit, why is it every time that something happens, a catastrophe happens, and I mean an earthquake or, or a hurricane, something? Why we always the motherfuckers begging? Mm -hmm. why, why, why we always the one in the motherfucking soup line first? And, and that's the only way I can say it, because, you know, I've really been doing good on my cussing, y'all. But we always are the ones that are the most needy. Because when there isn't a pandemic, when there isn't a hurricane, when there isn't a, a you know, the, the fires that y'all deal with in Southern Cal, you know what the problem is? We spend 98% of our time fucking off our money. We don't have any merch. I've been in this pandemic since late February, living off my emergency fund. Six months worth of money that I saved up. Nothing's behind. Nothing's been picked up. Nothing's been cut off. Because I'm responsible. And then you can't understand why the kids are not responsible. Because look at who's teaching them. But you know, my daddy used to say, and this is my last cuss word, hoes go back three generations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so ignorant black people go back three generations. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I know, you know, people don't like to be told what to do, but we, you know, we the blueprint is out there. The blueprint has not changed. And it's amazing to me how we tell you, like, and Dimitri will tell you, you know, she's known me for over 30 years. People will say, well, Donovan, how did you do this? How did you do it? And I will tell you exactly what you need to do. Boom, 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 boom. Do not deviate from it. This is the blueprint. We don't want to take that. But if Joe Blow over here tells you who doesn't have your interests at stake or isn't doing nothing, you, you know, keep voting them in and they keep telling you, I'll get you next time. Didn't Nancy Pelosi say that after the first uh, thing passed? Oh, you know, we didn't get it on this time, but on the next time. Now that the new bill has been proposed, those Republicans ain't going to vote for that, that new bill. And a lot of you out there that are essential workers, they've already said 30% of you guys ain't coming back to work. Now, mm. here, here in California, a lot of us are saying, okay, I could, I could hang out for two or three you know, months. You know, I got, I got a $1,200 check. I mean, sure I tell you, you know, living in California, I tell people all the time, if you can flee this place, flee. Because if you ain't got the money, you don't belong out here. But my point is this. You got people that live paycheck to paycheck. Okay, it's been two or three months. California just now extended the, uh, stay yeah, at home. The, the stay at home order. You just got a $1,200... Uh, one time payment. Now, what you gonna do? Your house is due, note to do, your car notes to do, and your credit is being wrecked because you ain't making payments on none of it. Final thoughts, Ms. Dimitri. Well, I mean, like you were asking, uh, with Katrina and uh, uh, Hurricane Harvey and all that happened, 
You said, why is it that black people are always begging? For one, we don't have any unity. We don't have, we don't practice group economics. Every other race of people, for the most part, can take care of themselves. But I think since we are in election season, we should be asking that of the big time Democrats that black people predominantly vote for. Ask them, why is it every time some a disaster happens, black people always got to go with their hands out? Ask them that because those are the people who write these laws and these policies and you know regulations and all these things. And they never do it with black people in mind. But every election season they come. Oh well, you know, I I did like that turkey last election season. And then we fall for a hook, line, and sinker. And then and you guys live with hurricane. I mean, from what I understand, I was telling me y'all getting ready to have hurricane season. You guys, you know, as we as we start, as we talk, so. We're in election season. Now is the time for y'all to be asking those people who are asking you to do something. Well, what you going to do for me? Because I don't have a problem having a Republican come up in here if they're going to do something, if it means getting you out of the way. Because I'm tired of hearing about people floating on their mattresses and refrigerators floating upside down and, you know, people starving. I'm tired of hearing about that. If you ain't actually going to do something for black people, then go on with that mess. I want to say something else, but I did. Final words, Donovan. Well, I'm going to have you guys remember this because it's the same game over and over again. When, whenever they come to an area, remember when the Indians, when they found, uh, they gave the Indians like uh, Black Rock in South Dakota and it was like a shitty area because it was full of like rocks and stuff. And they found all that gold there and they moved the Indians off. They do the same thing in our community. When they start gentrifying our community, there's a reason why. Right here in Southern California, where, where I'm at, they gentrified a whole area that Aunt Maxine uh, is responsible for. These people are sitting on million dollar homes and they took pennies to the dollar to move out to the desert where I'm at. So I'm telling you guys, use your common sense and really think about what they're doing and what's gonna happen with this pandemic? This has exposed people for having no wealth. If you had a reparations check right now, I don't even think we would be having this discussion. We give 97% of that away as we speak. If we got 17 plus trillion dollars in accounting, because that's what they owe us, and even more than that, we would give 97% of 17 trillion dollars back. We would give it to people who don't deserve it. We would give it to people who've already gotten reparations. The Asians have gotten reparations. The Jews have gotten reparations. We would give all of that money back. I'm going to end it with this. Brenda said whites are begging as well. I won't even read the rest of your comments. Why is it that every time we have a conversation, we start worrying about what the white folk is doing. Now, I want you to understand something. We're a wholesome show here, but some days we got to keep it real. You feel me? So I want you to think about R. Kelly for a minute. I'm going to leave you with this. And when you think about your neighborhood and what has not been done, I want you to remember that your Democrats is hitting all of us with the dick. You can get it in black, white, gold, whatever. That's how I feel about you Democrats because you're hitting us all with the dick. And I mean, and I mean what I say and I say what I mean. And that's what it is. So you know, bottom line, I ain't trusting none of them right now. I'm going to trust me. I'm going to bet on me. I'm going to make sure I do the right things. I'm going to make sure my, I got the financial literacy that I need, you know, and 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 keep hanging around good people like Demetra and, and Donovan and all of y'all and, and just try to stay positive. But I cannot put my faith in the hands of people who have already failed me. It's not gonna happen. Say, man. So I'm gonna tell you what you can do in the middle of a pandemic. Tomorrow night, 
You can be a mom of seven, seven kids, single, and start your own damn company. We're going to show you how to do it. Yes, tomorrow. A mom, seven kids, but started her own company just with recipes from her grandmother. Big Mama's collection. Carlos Johnson tomorrow night. You want to hit me on the cash app? Holla at me, man. Holla at me, man. Say, I want to thank my co-host Donovan Sadiq. Demetri K. And I am the five-star general. I see you tomorrow.